Give him praise, church. Amen. Good morning. You may be seated. Good to see everybody this morning. Welcome you. Welcome all those watching my TV and uh, internet. And uh, we got a lot to praise the Lord about. Amen. You know, uh, one thing last week we hosted the Carson Newman football team and had about 200 of them over here. And we went out in the fellowship hall and Rob shared the gospel and a challenge to them as believers too. But I have never seen young men eat so much. <laughs> I didn't think you could put that much food on a plate. <laughs> but those young guys really ate a lot. But you know one of the blessings, and I don't know if you saw it on Facebook this week, the last couple of days. I think Brother Dean said 13. 13 of those players were baptized this week in Mossy Creek. And so we praise the Lord for that. Don't forget, next Sunday morning is one service at 11 a.m., so don't forget that. We will have Sunday school next morning, but one service there, Labor Day weekend. Also, too, uh, there's still the little slips around to reserve your spot for the, uh, the luncheon. We're going to have the 24th of September. Need those in by the 10th, so if you haven't signed up that you want to be here for that, be sure to do that. You only need to sign up one time. You use one slip for the whole family if you want to. Just let us know how many are coming so we can do that. And we got get, this morning, we're honoring their Gideons this morning. We've got a whole row of those guys right here. Most of them I know and really thankful for them and what they do sharing scriptures, not only in our community, but around the world. Just, as, um, just, in a, just a quick note, just in Hamlin County, some Gideon facts. Distributed over 800 read New Testaments to Hamlin County Elementary Schools and four uh, private Christian schools. Distributed white testaments to nurses at both Waller State and the Tennessee Vocational Graduation Ceremonies. So we're thankful for them and what they did and what they do. So I hope and pray that you can give to help support that ministry. But here's, here's something about Gideons that maybe most of you don't know, or maybe you do. Every penny that we give, and all the churches give for Gideons, goes directly to purchase scriptures. There are no administration costs. All administration costs by the Gideon International is funded by the Gideons themselves. They pay for the work of all this, the network of churches. And so everything we give will go 100% to scriptures. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we get to heaven one day and somebody came, comes up to you and says, thank you for giving to the Gideon ministry. I was given a Bible and I read and heard about Jesus and trust him as Savior. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Let's give this morning to do that. So, Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your marvelous grace and infinite mercy. Thank you that 
all you've done for us. We can praise you. Help us this morning to worship you and give back to you our praise. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. And amen. Amen, church. Let's stand again. Let's sing together.
been faithful to you. Praise him, church. Amen. Peace 
church as brother Dean comes Jesus oh what a name what a name Jesus we thank you for your presence in this place today we thank you for the lives that have been changed that are going to be changed just by the mention of your name Jesus I just pray that you anoint your preacher today with the words. Fill him, fill his mouth, God. Anoint him with your Holy Spirit. May we leave here never the same as when we came in. We love you, we praise you, we worship and adore you in this place today. Amen. Thank you, church. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, worship team. I was praying Jesus over you today, church. He's our only hope. He's our only hope in the midst of this dark world. He's the only hope that we have to get us home. He's the only hope for our families. So I speak the name of Jesus over this body of believers that have gathered here today. And I pray for the awesome and almighty power of the Holy Spirit to fill us with his presence. Jesus. Can you say it with me? Jesus. Let's say it again. Jesus. I just wanted to speak the name of Jesus over whatever trial or problem or difficulty that you're going through. He can take care of it. And if you're here today without Christ as your Savior, it's no accident. This is your day. This is your day to humble yourself before the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So that's my prayer for you today. Before we jump into the Word in just a few moments, I just have to say a word about one of my favorite ministries of all time, and that's the Gideon ministry. These men and women, businessmen and businesswomen, 
who put the Scriptures in the hands of people literally all across the world. Since their inception, they have now given out 2.5 billion copies of the Word of God in 108 different languages. And I'm so proud that they are here today. Many of the ones in our camp here in the Hamlin Lakeway area are here today. Sanford, thank you. Some of you guys, this is your second go around today. And I appreciate that so much. First Baptist, we have an opportunity to put scriptures in the hands of people in motels and hotels, people in our jails, our prisons, our schools. When you leave today, there's going to be a basket at the door, or at the entrance, or exits at the doors in the balcony down below. Why don't we just give the biggest offering to the Gideons that we've ever given before in the history of our church. How about we do that, church? Amen. If you're going to eat out today, give at least as much to the Gideons as you're going to spend going out to eat, all right? I believe in this ministry, and I'm thankful for all of these men and women who are so faithful to make sure that how many lives have been changed. Somebody, a hotel, motel room, We've, I've heard so many stories about, man, they were on their last leg. They were going to commit suicide, but they found a Gideon Bible in a hotel room and began to read the Word and began to, hear, to read the Gospel, and their lives were changed. I pray that I always want us to be a part of that. And so I pray that you will do the very best you can. And then church next Sunday, next Sunday is going to begin our birthday celebration. We're not just having one Sunday. No, we're having the whole month of September. And next Sunday, one service all together. Get here early because it's going to be packed. Next Sunday, we're going to be thinking about and remembering the legacy of our past. Matter of fact, at 1045, as you're coming in, there'll be... There'll be pictures that'll be up on the... We have over 200 pictures of things that have happened in the past of our church, and we're going to begin with an old-fashioned hymn sing. And then we'll begin the service at 11 o'clock, and Dr. Randy Davis, former pastor here, as well as executive director for the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board, will be our special guest speaker that day. So I hope that you will come next week. The next two Sundays, we'll be emphasizing September 10th, Mission Opportunities. Do you realize that your church is involved in over 60 different mission opportunities around our area and around the world? And then on the 17th, we're going to be talking about the ministries of our church and all that happens inside the walls of this church. And it is absolutely amazing, and many of you are a part of that. And then on the 24th, we'll have one service beginning at 1030, and I'm telling you, we're going to have overflow I'm sure we're going to be absolutely jam-packed. We're going to have a big tent set up. We're going to have dinner on the grounds to follow a big church-wide photograph. Uh, I mean, there's going to be a lot going on. Happy birthday, First Baptist Morristown, 220 years old. Were any of you here back in 1803? <laughs> we are going to honor some folks that have been members here for over 70 years, and we're going to remember them uh, as we go through this. But it's going to be a wonderful day, and I'm grateful to all of our committees and people who have worked so very hard. Well, take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Acts chapter 4. We're going to begin at verse 8 in just a moment. It's page 968 in your pew Bible in case you need that to follow along with that copy of God's Word. Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 8. We've been looking at a series of messages. Who is First Baptist Morristown? I was so convicted to, to share this series of messages prior to our 220th birthday celebration as a church because, listen, if we don't know who we are, how can we know what God wants us to do and where God wants us to go as a church? And so I hope that that's been clearly defined over the last few weeks. We have talked about the fact that we are a great commission church. We believe in taking the gospel to the entire world. That's why we believe in what the Gideons are doing. We are also a great commandment 
church, loving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves, as Jesus said, the greatest of all the commandments. And then last week we talked about that we are a great commitment church. We are committed to being a God-honoring, gospel-focused, Bible-centered, maturity-driven, people-passionate church. But I want to add one more truth to it today. One more truth before we say happy birthday, happy birthday First Baptist Morristown, and that is that we are also a great conviction church. A great conviction church. Now, before we look at our text this morning, I want you to understand what I mean by conviction. The word conviction can be understood in at least three different ways. Conviction can be, number one, a guilty verdict that is handed down in court, as in conviction for a crime. Well, I did the crime, and now I'm going to have to do the time. I've been convicted of a crime. Some of you guys that went with us in July on our Israel trip, our college Israel trip, you will be reminded that in order to cut costs, in order, you know, college kids, we don't have, they don't have any money, so we tried to get as cheap a Israel trip as we possibly could. We stayed at a camp outside of Tel Aviv called Baptist Village, kind of a dormitory kind of camp, and we even took a couple of ladies along that would cook our meals at breakfast time and at dinner time. We were trying to cut cost. But then I discovered that the ladies who were cooking meals for us packed 10 packages of vacuum-sealed bacon to take with us to Israel. <laughs> now you say, Pastor Dean, what is the big deal about taking bacon to Israel? The Jewish people do not eat pork, and pork is not kosher, and bacon comes from pork. Some of you don't know that. You thought it came from Kroger, but it actually comes from pork. We tried our best to convince these two ladies as they put that vacuum-packed bacon in their luggage, Israeli security is going to find you out. <laughs> they are going to find you out, they're going to open your luggage, and you will be accused and convicted for the crime of smuggling bootleg bacon into Israel. I have never eaten bacon in Israel before. I almost felt guilty till the first bite. <laughs> we had bacon every morning for breakfast. Marlon, was that not awesome? <laughs> I finally got Marlon to do I say amen. I felt better about it, church when as we were leaving, we still had one package left, 72 pieces in each package. We had one package left. We went through the bacon, but guess who we gave it to? To our Jewish messianic guide. <laughs> oh, can I have that? And he took the bacon, and I said, Yoni, are you allowed to do that? He said, oh, Brother Dean, don't, don't forget that I am both saved and delivered. So he took the bacon <laughs> home with him. One way that you can understand conviction is if you are convicted for a crime. But that's not what we're talking about today. Another way is conviction that comes as a result of guilt. Guilt because you have done something and the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and convicts you that you should not have said that. You should have not done that. You should have not gone there. Jesus said in John 16, 8, that the Holy Spirit is there to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin, the fact that I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. Righteousness, I need a righteousness that is beyond my own and judgment, if I do not have a Savior, I'm going to stand before God without any hope someday. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that produces a guilt that leads, that should lead, and listen, should lead to repentance. But the kind of conviction that I want to talk to you about this morning 
is a conviction that means an uncompromising, unwavering belief about the things of God. It's been said that a belief is something that you hold, but a conviction is something that holds you. And that's what I want to talk about today. Are you in Acts chapter 4 this morning? God used Peter and John to heal a lame man at the temple in Acts chapter 3. It gave Peter the platform to be able to preach to the Jewish people and tell them this Jesus indeed is the Messiah. This Jesus indeed is the Christ. It caused such a stir, however, that Peter and John were arrested and they were kept overnight in the temple prison. The next morning, Peter and John were brought out before the Sanhedrin, before the council, and they had, were interrogated by this group of Jewish religious leaders. In verse 7, the Sanhedrin asked Peter this question, By what power or by what name have you done this miracle? Peter responded to him in Holy Spirit-filled conviction. Look at his responses. Two responses I want you to look at in your Bible. Response number one, verses 8 through 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, Psalm 118. Now listen to this conviction. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Brothers and sisters, that's Holy Spirit conviction. And he stood filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with conviction. But here's the second response. Look at it beginning in verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they had not been with one of their rabbis. You could follow a rabbi and he would teach you and train you everything. He knows. No, they had not been with one of the Jewish rabbis, one of their trained rabbis. They marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Isn't it interesting you can tell somebody that's walking with Jesus? You can tell by their life, their spirit, everything about them. You can tell if they've spent time with the Lord Jesus Christ. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could not say anything against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them. It's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Look at verse 19. Here's conviction. Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Now listen, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Holy Spirit conviction of what they believed. And now they're preaching it, teaching it, saying it in front of this council. Now church, I want you to get this in your mind, your heart, but in your spirit, in your notes. I want you to get what I'm about to say. There is a big difference between our convictions and our preferences. Our preferences are always changing. Our preferences throughout life will change over and over and over. There was a time in my life where I thought the most disgusting thing I'd ever put in my mouth was blue cheese dressing. Disgusting. But now... I got an amen from Brother Steve just then. <laughs> but now, I like blue cheese dressing. That's a preference. 
My preference changed from a younger time to now when I'm an old man. My preferences changed. And some people in the faith do the same thing. So, well, I used to believe that a long time ago, but I don't believe that anymore. And I'm wide open. If something comes in the future, I'll just change my mind and believe that too. That's preferences. But do we have any convictions? Do we have anything that holds us? Do we have any truths that say, you know what, I cannot bend, I will not break, and I cannot compromise these Conviction. A person who lives by preferences only has no foundation. They're like a double-minded man. They're just here today, there the next day, believe this, this day, something else the next day, and their life is just all over the place. I'm asking today, do you have any convictions in your life about your faith? I believe our church has some convictions. And before we enter into our 220th birthday party celebration anniversary, I want to just give you five of them. Five convictions that I believe that we hold as a church. And listen, I pray that this is your conviction as well. But five convictions that I want to leave you with before we start next Sunday celebrating the history and legacy of our church church. Number one, number one, we believe there is one true God. We believe there is one true God manifested through the triunity of the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. John said in 1 John chapter 5 verse 7, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. It is the triune God that we believe in, and all three in one are responsible for our salvation. And I declare to you today, as a matter of conviction, that our God is a sovereign God. He is an all-powerful God. He's an all-knowing God, always present. He is faithful, loving, promise-keeping, sin-forgiving compassionate, just, and ready to offer salvation to any who call upon His name. Ready to save you if you will call upon the name of Jesus here today. And our one true God is the one worthy of our service and worship and praise. John said in Revelation chapter 5, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And we're to have no other gods before our one true God. Deuteronomy 6, 13 and 14. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him only. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. Do you think there are any gods all around us today that we need to stay away from? We worship the one true God. We hold conviction in our heart that He is the true and only God, the one true God manifest as a tri-unity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And His name is not Allah, the moon God. We worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from the Word of the living God. Conviction number two. We believe in the authority of Scripture. Again, that's why I love the Gideons so much. They, too, they believe that too. They believe that within these pages is the power of the gospel that can change a man's life. And our conviction, our conviction is that we are going to believe the Word of God. We're going to believe it unto salvation if God's Word says it's good, it's good. If God's Word says it's evil, it's evil, and we're going to stay away from it. We're going to believe it morally, socially, politically, spiritually. In every way, we are going to believe that this book is no ordinary book, but this book contains the life of the Lord Himself that He wants to impart into our lives. We believe in its authority and its power. We're not going to follow the crowd. 
Man, listen to me. Jesus said this in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. It is easy, easy, easy to go the broad way, the way that leads to destruction. But you know what? We're going to follow the narrow way. You know where the narrow way is, church? Right here. Right here. We're going to follow the narrow way. Because it's the narrow way, Jesus said, that leads to life and leads to eternal life. We believe that these pages are not just pages that were written by men. Over 40 authors, 66 books, penned over 1,500 years, and the unity, the power of God's Word is just impressive. We believe that this is our conviction. It is the God-breathed, inspired, and inerrant Word of God, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We believe, Psalm 12, 6, that the law of the Lord is perfect. We believe, Proverbs 30, verse 5, that every word of God is pure. And may we have the courage to live it and believe it. And preachers, listen, we got preachers that listen to our service. Get a little backbone. Get a little backbone and preach this book like you really believe it. Don't stand in the pulpit Sunday after Sunday and apologize. I talked about this last week. Don't apologize and don't, you know, listen, there's too much preaching going on today from preachers that say, well, I'm here today to help you to build up your self-esteem. No, you need to die to your self-esteem and enthrone the Lord Jesus Christ according to the Word of God. Listen, we, we got to get alone, preachers, we got to get alone with God and we got to get prayed up and studied up and filled up and then come out Sunday after Sunday and just preach the book. Preach the Lord Jesus Christ and preach it like we believe it. Amen. There are many people today that say, well, I don't have a conviction that He's the one true God. I don't have a conviction of the authority of God's Word over my life. That's why I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And it prevents them from this third conviction. Listen to our third conviction. We believe Jesus is the only way to salvation. Some of you may already be thinking, man, that's way too narrow, Pastor. You believe Jesus is the only way to God? He's the only way of salvation? I sure do. I sure do. I believe that He is the only possibility for a lost sinner to be made right in the eyes of a holy God. He is not one of many ways. He, listen to me, this is a conviction he is the only way to salvation. From our text today, Peter said, Nor is there salvation in any other, Acts 4.12, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one, no one comes to the Father except through me. Listen to me. You will not make it to heaven based on your achievements. You will not make it to heaven based on your popularity or how big a business you were able to create or your reputation or your own personal goodness or personal piety. There's only one way to be saved and that is by trusting in what Jesus did for you when He shed His rich, royal, regal blood for you on the cross of Calvary and then three days later rose up from the grave conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave and you must humble yourself before that message and say, Jesus, I believe you're my only hope you're my only way to be saved. And when you do that, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen and amen. When the crowds of Jesus' day were all leaving him, he turned to his men and said, you guys want to leave too? You remember what Peter said? In John chapter 6, verses 68 and 69, look at the screen. Lord, to whom shall we go? If, if we leave you, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you 
are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Look at this next picture. The cross is the only bridge between a sinful man or woman and a holy God. The only bridge. And that chasm is really deep because our sin has separated us from God. And Jesus Christ alone is the one who can save you, the one who can redeem you, the one that can give you the promise of eternal life. Jesus Christ alone is the one that fits us for heaven and gives us the gift of salvation. We believe in the one true God. We believe in the authority of Scripture. We believe that Jesus is not just a way, He is the only way to be saved. Conviction number four. We believe our number one goal is to be obedient to Jesus. Is that your goal in your life? Number one goal of my life is to do what He says. Well, I do a few things, but I don't do much else. I try to be obedient for an hour on Sunday morning, but not much through the week. You know what? We talked about this, that if the Lord Jesus is our life, how can we not be all in? How can we not live for Him every single day, every moment of every day, and say, Lord, more than anything else, I love you and I want to keep your commandments. Listen to what Jesus said, John 14, 15. If you love me, do what, church? Let's say it. Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. 2 John chapter 2, verse 6. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. Our identity is in Jesus Christ. I, I, I don't know about anybody else, but... Sometimes being in the Bible Belt, I get so sick and tired of cultural Christianity. You you know what that is? Well, the only reason I go to church or the only reason I try to behave is because my grandma and grandpa told me that's what I ought to do. How about being born again? And how about following the Lord Jesus because He has flipped your life upside down and you love Him more than anything else. And oh, I wouldn't want to do anything that would bring shame to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How about loving Him like that? It's our conviction. If we truly love Him, we're going to keep His commandments. By the way, there are 40 different commands of Christ. I did a study on this. I've told you about this before. It's a couple of years ago. Still got it. If anybody wants that, to put notes in your Bible. 40 commandments of Christ that are found in the New Testament. Be glad to give that to you. See, our convictions cannot be based, church, listen to me, can't be based on our comfort. They can't be based on our preferences and our choices and how we feel and our emotions. No, listen, our convictions have to be based on the fact we believe in this Word and we want to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ with everything that we have. So here are our convictions. Number one, we believe in the one true God. Number two, we believe there is one true book. Number three, we believe there is one true way to salvation. Number four, we believe there is one clear path that we are to walk. And number five, I've got to include this one. We believe there is one certain future. And what is that? Look at it in your notes. We believe that Jesus is coming back someday to rule and to reign. We sing about it all the time, but do we really believe that? First, He's coming back for His church, for the bride, to save us from the wrath that is going to be poured out on this earth. Now, not persecution. Jesus even said, you will probably, you will face persecution. But the wrath is God's white-hot anger on sinful man because of his rejection of God. And Jesus already bore that on Calvary when he died to pay for the wrath of God satisfied as we sang about. 
He's coming back for His church. But then He's coming with us to rule and reign. Man, the Scriptures are so clear about this. It's called the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what the Scriptures say. John said in Revelation 1, Behold, He's coming with clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. Even so, amen. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 27, For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 44, Jesus said, Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to His works. Revelation eleven fifteen. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Folks, we believe that. That, that, that's not just something that we say. We believe that Jesus is literally, physically returning to this earth because that's what the Bible says. And we believe it. By the way, we also believe that he, because of all of that, He's not given up on Israel either. Amen. Romans 9, 10, and 11, read it for yourself. God has blinded the Jewish people, but there is coming a day and Paul says it in Romans chapter 11, when their eyes will be opened and they will see that Jesus was indeed their Messiah. But until that day, we have an obligation and a responsibility as a largely Gentile church to minister to them and to show them the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what we're doing with Harvest of Israel. We don't want to just talk about it. We want to do something about it. That's why this next week we're going to be sending container 99 and container 100 from God's warehouse to Israel. Why? Because we believe the Bible. And we believe God's not finished with the Jewish people whom He made a covenant with. He is not finished with them. And Jesus is their only hope. Jesus is the hope of Israel. Jesus is the hope and Messiah of Israel. Israel, but He is also our only hope for eternal salvation. We're to provoke the Jews to jealousy. And we do that through all that we've done as a church. Listen, these are convictions. It, this is not just something that we say from time to time. This is something that we really believe. And we back it up with our lives that we believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. Believer, do you have any convictions? You have some convictions in your own life. You say, man, I, I can't go across this. I can't do that. Man, this is a conviction. This, this thing holds me. This thing grips me. This thing guides me. Man, I, 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 can't, I can't go across my convictions. Now, I, I, I want to say something to every believer in this room. It is easy to come into the church and have convictions because most of the folks are like-minded in the church. But get outside the church, where you work, where you go to school, and outside of the Bible Belt, and you will find Christian believers that are standing up for their conviction with all the energy that they have, and God bless them. And they are being persecuted. They're being talked about. Some of them are losing their jobs, but they are standing up for their convictions based on the Word of God. Oh, if we have it a little easier here, wouldn't it be great for us to do the same thing and stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ all across the world and say, we are not going to compromise. We're not going to cross this line. We are going to stay true to the Word of the living God. Amen. It's easy to stand up for your convictions when everybody's agreeing with you. It takes a different kind of person. And we don't do it hatefully. And we don't do it out of 
you know, because we're angry. It takes a different kind of person with a steel backbone to say, you know what, this is a conviction. I can't, I can't, I, I can't go beyond this. I want us more than anything else to be a strong church. A church that believes and has convictions and convictions that will never compromise. It is better to live for Christ and follow His commandments than to compromise with this world and be drawn into its darkness.